so we'll start with a short meditation. So when one sits down after having talked, you know, uh, with people, you notice that the mind is a little bit agitated, you know, like water at the surface, you know, little waves. <coughs> so by focusing in the attention on the movement of the breath, very gently bring it to the uh, <coughs> present moment of awareness. And it's like a tide, like a, a wave that dies onto the shore and retracts and comes back on the shore. So there's this movement of the breath that is very soothing. So you just focus it a bit on the breath. And then put your attention to consciousness. You see, you're conscious of the breath. What is that phenomenon, consciousness? You are aware of the breath. What is awareness? You see, this consciousness, that thing that is aware of the breath, is like a space, <coughs> is something intangible. And the av adventure of life is the adventure of this consciousness. So this consciousness exists on an ordinary level. That consciousness exists on a more subtle level, like when we are in a dream state, and exists on an even more subtle level. And that's that more subtle level that travels from lifetime to lifetime. So it's not our ordinary, gross, superficial mind. It's something more subtle within that. And if you touch that more subtle level of your awareness, that thing that is immaterial in you, then you touch your eternity. You touch that thing in you that has no beginning and no end. That has always existed 
and will always exist, the innermost core of your being. Now with this consciousness, you can care, you see, you can care for a person that is dear to you in your life. You can cultivate the thought, may he or she be happy. Like I myself aspire to be happy and have the right to be happy, he or she also has the same wish in the same right as me and you put yourself in his or her shoes and then you cultivate this thought towards the second person that is close to you in your life and wish him or her well as well. May he or she be happy, free of problems, like I myself. And gradually you expand this state of consciousness to more and more beings. So you try to touch their heart, you see, deep inside they're like me, they just want to be happy, like me. And how wonderful it would be if everyone were happy, if everyone were free from problems, how wonderful it would be. So with your heart, you touch the heart of all the beings in this room, all the people you left back home, people in your community, people in your country, people on the whole planet, and wherever living beings are, you imagine with your heart, you touch their heart and wish them sincerely from the heart, may they be happy. May they be free of problems, just like me. How wonderful it would be if we were all happy. If we were all free from suffering. So it's a state of consciousness. <coughs> See what it does to your mind, to your space of awareness. It fills it with warmth, with caring energy, with light. When you care from the heart, it's such a nice state of mind to be in. So this state of mind of universal love and compassion, you see, you, you can, um, there's again these three different stage, stage where you read about it, you learn a few meditation about it, and you know, you do it from time to time. But then you have a second level where you do it repeatedly again and again and again, and it becomes deeper and more sincere and more pervasive, you know? And you get there, 
quicker and quicker to that level of experience where you reach a point you're so acquainted with it that simply thinking love compassion you have this huge heart that embraces all living beings very sincerely very deep you see you don't need any more the thought that brings you there right you see, but to get there, you have first to go to the step of cultivating again, again, and again. Then it becomes, you see, at the beginning it is through effort, through a stream of thought. And you do that again and again. And then you need less and less steps to get to that state of consciousness. Right? Till one day, just simply about love, you know, just, just you see something, you know, in the news or on TV, you know, or you see an animal, you know, or a person being sick or, you know, having problem, and suddenly you, mind of love and compassion, embrace all living beings, because the problem that person has is a universal problem, it's not just that person. We're all in the same boat, right? Kind of like that. So this comes to training, you know, this state of mind, and it's such a beautiful experience. Now in the graduate path to enlightenment, there's 14, about 14 of those meditation state of consciousness that you try to master, right? So one of is the awareness of karma, you know, that you see each action we do has consequences. Each thought, each speech, each action we have leaves an imprint in our consciousness, it's never lost. Right? And that brings about a reaction that comes back, you know. Uh, you, you, what say, you rape what you sow. You reap. You reap. Thank you. <laughs> you reap what you sow, right? So it's very much like that, you know. But not, and you know, you, you, you sow one thing, it comes back a thousand times stronger, right? So whatever positive or negative energy we send out, that energy comes back a thousand times bigger, right? So one learns to control one's thought, speech, so that one doesn't create any negative energy going out, right? So one tries to cultivate good thought, good speech, and good behavior, you know, because it's never lost, it comes back to oneself someday, in one form or in another. So one learns that to be mi become mindful day in, day out of how we are, right? And then whatever negative thought we have, you see, how to say, even by being very careful, one creates negative thought. Sometimes one says something negative or some, does something negative, right? So it happens. So, but like our teeth get dirty over time, you know, we, we keep on brushing them, you know, morning, evening, you know, kind of, we keep on taking showers and we keep on cleaning our house. So it's the same thing, we can have a general maintenance of the mind. You see, our consciousness accumulates this negative thought, negative behavior. So it, it how to say, it stains the mind, it, it takes, it clouds its purity. Right? But this you can clean, you know, so by cleaning it regularly, you can have a maintenance of your mind that actually you're always happy, you know. What happens when your mind becomes bored, dull, um, how to say, you're slightly depressed, you're, you're in a mood and nothing exciting, you know, you're lazy, and you know, you have this, Eh, you know. Oh, not another day. You know. Oh, no. You know. The same old thing. You know. You, know. Uh, you know. So you don't have that wakefulness of a child, you know, that excitement. Oh, yet, another day. What can we play today? You, know? okay. you, you lose that peppiness. And you haven't been a bad person. You know, you haven't, you know, killed somebody or done something awful to someone. No, but it's these little things, day by day, that the dust that accumulates in the mind, you know, like the dust that accumulates in a house. You know, for example, I'm surprised I live in Washington State, you know. I clean the house once a week, not more, you know. But after one week, you know, I pass the thing, everywhere is covered with dust. 
you know. And I haven't opened the window, I haven't opened the door, but it seems just the door <laughs> spontaneously <laughs> manifests. I know, it's amazing. That, uh, you know. And probably you have similar experience, right? You know, it's funny how the dust comes. So then you imagine, well, it must be the same for the mind. You know, that also accumulates dust. You know? So it needs to keep on being cleaned. You know? And that's why you have a spiritual method to cleanse your mind. You know? So if you keep on regularly cleaning your mind, you actually keep on being a happy person. You know, you know, with curiosity, awake, and things. What makes the mind dull and, and bored and things is that this accumulation of, you know, uh, negative thoughts. I did once a longer retreat in Spain. And so when you, do, when you go into isolation for a long period of time, what happens to your mind is that during the first six months you experience different state of mind. You see, for example, in everyday life, when you get upset, you know why you get upset. Or oh, this person did that to me, or this thing. But when you're alone, <laughs> you don't see anybody. There's, you, you cannot blame others for your state of mind, right? So, so then you remember, oh, this is because I remember that thing from the past. And so basically you go back in your mind, different moods you experience. Oh, oh this is because last year or 10 years ago. And like that, you go back up to your childhood. You know, you, you actually remember, oh, now, yeah, I'm a little bit, you know, sad today because, yes, this, that happened, you know, when I was five years old, you know. Okay. Yeah, it happens, you know, you explain a certain mood, you say, why do I have that? And that image comes to your mind, you know, that memory comes up, pops up, you know, like that. And you, so during uh, the five, uh, six, eight first months, is all about this life. You can see an image, you know, from me from somewhere in your life. But after eight, ten months, you don't have even any more any more image. But you experience these moods. You know, sometimes for months you slightly depressed and you don't know. You're actually happy with your practice, with your daily there's nothing wrong with, at all with what you're doing. But you Yeah <laughs> you know, oh, not another day of the same routine, you know. And you don't know why you're excited, you're happy to do what you do, but you have these moods, you know. And then you realize these are imprints from previous lives you start dealing with, not only from this life. These are other states of con that are more subtle, more enduring, you know, lingering in the subconscious that affects you. So and then you so you clean, clean, and then you get rid of that, mm -hmm. right? So there's many layers like that in the mind. Mm -hmm. no? mm -hmm. So that's why it's good to have a certain uh, how to say, like one takes a shower, you know, regularly, like one brushes one teeth, to take care of the mind in a similar way, mm -hmm. to have a cleansing of the mind, you know. So there's many methods for that, you know, in different tradition, you know. So it's very good to learn something like that. Like we, in our tradition, we call it the four opponent power. You know, so if you remember something you've done negative to counter its force, you regret having done that negative action. You know, it counters that energy. Then you create the determination. You know, from now on, I'll try to behave better. You know, not to indulge in that negative way. You know, and then you try to. Uh, reaffirm your spiritual determination, you know, you, your trust in the purity of the mind you know, and in your good heart, you know, you're caring for all living beings, you know, like that. And then, you know, and then you compensate, you know, you know, oh yeah, I've been, you know, you know I've been selfish, that maybe tonight I do the dishes, you know, you know, or, you know, tomorrow, you know, I, I wash his or her car, you know. So you, you composite, you create a, neg a positive action to counter that negative action you've done, you know. So then it's also one can recite mantras or different visualization, different practice, you know. Basically it's doing a good things, you know, to counterbalance the negative actions one has done. So and then the, if you do that, if you keep care of your mind like that, you're actually always happy. You know, and then when it's time to die, you don't have any regret. You can, you know, you took care of your mind and you have nothing much 
left unresolved, untaken care of. And you, yeah, you're not happy to die, you know, who's happy with that? But you at least have no regret. You say, I did my best, you know, let's go on, you know. This body is falling apart, let's get a new one, you know. <laughs> Can you know? Yeah, so a little bit like that. You know. As we grow older and older and older, you know, it starts not functioning so well anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like that. So I think this is the second step. The, the, how to say, the first step of spiritual evolution is actually to take care of one's mind, to keep a healthy mind. You see, to keep a healthy, happy mind by taking care of one's karma. That's the first step. And then the second step is to be disenchanted by worldly life. Is being disenchanted by our sense pleasure. They never last. They are not satisfying. No matter how much food you eat, you always get hungry again. You know, no much you enjoy going here and there, you still want this and that more. You know, you we never satisfied with sense pleasure. We never have enough of them. You know, they are not the source of everlasting blissful experience. You know, no matter how much you have something, you want always more, or you want again. You can think of anything you like, you see, you never have enough, you always want to repeat it again. You know? And that, that's the unsatisfied nature of an ordinary life, you know. A non-enlightened life has this frustration of, of never having enough, never having contentment, never have enough, you know. And that's a profound, how to say, it's the, it's the fault of nobody, you know. It's not my fault, it's not your fault, it's not because we do something wrong. It's just the nature of this type of experience. It's impermanent, it's changing, so therefore it never lasts, you know. Your partner, your children are constantly changing. They never stay this beautiful, rosy, six-months-old baby, you know. Hey, he's growing old, older, right? So he's not the baby anymore. And then he becomes a turbulent adolescent and then he you know and then he leaves home, right? <laughs> and he lives his own life, right? So and it's nobody's fault, it's just the nature of life. Mm -hmm. Right? And I would like to enjoy the sunset forever. Mm -hmm. But the sun sets and then it's dark, <laughs> you know. And it's nobody's fault. You know, it's myself with my unrealistic expectation that wanted to last forever. That, you know, it's just the nature of thing to pass. So there's this frustration in life, you know, that leads to this dissatisfaction. Things don't last, and it's nobody's fault. It's just the nature of thing. So to expect a permanent, everlasting happiness from something that doesn't last. You see, it's a conundrum that it's, in, it's an impossibility to experience everlasting happiness from something that doesn't last. We, we're going to always lose that battle, mm -hmm. right? Uh, yet we keep on repeating it again with another person, with another object, with another house, with another holiday. But it's, all these things never last, right? Yet we expect them to produce in us everlasting happiness. It's impossible. That's what the Buddha discovered. Right? So everlasting happiness is possible within the space of consciousness that doesn't depend on this outer thing. There's a blissful state of consciousness that can be experienced. But we look for it at the wrong place. You know, we look for it in object and people that are impermanent, that don't last. So we expect to get fulfillment, <coughs> everlasting fulfillment from something that doesn't last. It's impossible, right? But if you look for it within your consciousness that is eternal, there you can find it. There it is. 
you know. So there is a blissful state of consciousness that lasts forever. And that's what the Buddha has discovered. Right? And there's a state of consciousness that pervades all that exists and sees past, present and future and can help beings eternally and never suffers again. And we all have the potential to achieve that. Right? But to look for that, you have first to give up running after this and that. Because how to say... How to say... Hmm, to look for this everlasting state of inner bliss and joy is some work. You know, it's not something you can do you know, by doing 10 minutes a week and expect some progress over your life, you know, by doing 10, 10 minutes a week, you know, or one hour of yoga, you know, we do one hour of yoga a week, right? So by doing one hour of spiritual work is not enough to get to that experience, right? So how do you get more time? How do you get more time? It's by realizing the unsatisfactory nature of worldly pleasure. You know, that they will never bring you a total satisfaction. So you let go, you let go, and have more time to this inner work. You know? So that's the purpose of being disenchanted with worldly experience, by realizing their impermanence. You know? And you see, so you have the as I said before, the insight that comes by thinking about it a little bit. But if you think about it on and on and on and on, it really changes your behavior, it changes the way you use your free time. Because what you thought was fun is not any more fun to you. You, know, you say, yeah, well, it's not going to last. You see already that's not going to last. And that after you, it will leave you with that missing and you want to repeat that experience again because you miss it. And it's like, you know, an addiction to any form of pleasure we have. We get addicted, it doesn't last, then we repeat it again and again and again. And it never brings satisfaction. You know? But we don't know anything else, so we keep on doing that same thing. Not knowing that there is a state of consciousness that has this eternal bliss in us, you know? If we let go and look inside, this bliss can be achieved. You know? So you reach a point by doing that again and again, that worldly pleasure, you have no interest anymore. Because you see, they're not going to last and I'm going to be unsatisfied at the end anyway. And I want to repeat it and I don't want to get that, to that state of mind that uh, I'm a needy person needing for this, needing for that and never getting satisfied. You know? So you let go of the whole thing and say, no, that's not going to produce happiness. And you let go. You know? And that is a state of mind you can achieve. We each one can achieve. You know? It's just... Thinking about it, repeating, and, and seeing if it's true, you know. You think about all your pleasure, all the things you like. Has it you ever given permanent satisfaction? Well, then, if it has given permanent satisfaction, why do I need it again? You know? And then, so, I have this missing, uh, needy, you know. I have this desire for that thing. So, I think, okay, so the suffering or the painful feeling of missing that thing stops when I get it. Oh, ah, you know, so I, I don't miss it anymore, I have it. You know? But it's not lasting. That sensation is not lasting. Soon I, either I get bored with that thing, you know, or that thing passes, and then I miss again. So isn't it better to let go of the missing mind? You know, letting go of that state of mind. And just experience, you know, the state of mind that doesn't miss anything. You see, and that consciousness is not only in this life, it's in next life, next life, next life. For example, myself, I think I was some kind of practitioner in a previous life. Why I say that? 
because I have some realization in this life as a child. You see, as a child, I think maybe 10, 9 years old, I had the thought coming in my mind, what's the purpose of all that if it all ends with death? What's the purpose of getting this job, of getting that crown? What's the purpose of all our life if it ends with death? Mm. You know, what's the purpose of that? You know, I had that thought that, you know, as a nine, ten years old child, and it nags me. You know, what's the purpose? You know, you have to think about your future, what you want to do. And I had that thought, you know, what's the purpose of if it ends with death? And I think I was also reading Solomon's so, so, you know, vanity, vanity, everything is vanity, you know, he was the king of the Jews, you know, we read that at a Bible school, you know, and he was complaining, you know, because nothing lasts, you know, his pleasure and things like that. So, yeah, and so, but where did that thought come from as a 10 years old child, you know, so that imprint, where does that come from? Because Probably in the previous life, I was meditating on impermanence and death. I, so that imprint stuck, and then as a child, you know, I had that thought. Because where did it come from? No? I wasn't exposed to this idea in this life. So this came, but yet it influenced then my whole life, right? So that's why I discovered Buddhism as I was 20 years old. Right? So whatever insight you have in this life is not lost. You see, whatever you gain next life, it will make you look for more than what meets the eye sooner. Because that insight will stay with you. you know? So whatever you gain is not lost. You know, what level of love and compassion, good heart you generate, it will be with you when you're born. You know, naturally we care with the, for the animals, the insect, for your brother, sister. You have a kind heart because that's what you have cultivated. You know, so so you see, whatever state of mind you you gain in this life is not lost. Even if you don't get enlightenment in this, it doesn't matter. Whatever quality you develop, that's yours. You know, so it's it's really worth the effort. You know? So. You know, whatever state of mind we develop. So, same thing with disenchantment with pleasure. You know, you'll be born and see, oh, but this doesn't last. You know, you, you playmate enjoy this and that. And say, but what's the point? You know, it doesn't last. You know? So, that thought will be with you. That wisdom, that insight will carry over. And then, so that leads you then to the next step, where to discover what's the cause of all that. You see, all our, our negative emotion, desire, you see, how does desire function? You know, the, the desire it uh, takes out a person or an object and focus on the positive qualities of that person and that object and exaggerate exaggerate the beauty of the... For example, when you fall in love with somebody, you only see the beautiful qualities of that person, you know, and you exaggerate this beautiful quality, and then you fall in love with that, mm. you know. And then, of course, when you start living with that person, you start seeing also that, oh, that person also has negative... Oh, that also has negative... Oh, that, that person also go to toilet. Oh, you know? <laughs> That, that person also has dirty laundry. Oh, you know, can, can suddenly you discover before you didn't see that at all. You know, you just see the beautiful side of the person. You know, you didn't notice that side. And then gradually, when the band becomes back to neutral, so to see, then you see the person in a more holistic way, right? But so the point of desire is to exaggerate the beautiful qualities, you know. The description of desire attachment is a mind that exaggerates the beautiful quality of a person or an object and then focus on that and wants it. Right? That's how desire functions. So it's a mistaken perception of how the object or the person actually exists. It's an exaggeration of the positive qualities. 
right? And if you check, you know, when you, you buy a new car, you know, it has to, woo, you know, it's all shiny and things like that. And yet, you know, then after a while, somebody scratches it, you know, can you, in a parking lot. You can't, I don't know, have you ever had a new car? And then when you get the first scratch in a parking lot, oh, <laughs> terrible. It's almost like somebody rips your heart, you know, oh, you know, who did that, you know, Ooh. how could they, not even leaving a name or something, or a check or something, you know, nothing, you know, they just disappear. <laughs> So yes, desire function on an exaggeration of the positive quality. So you have to, you see, that's what the Buddha discovered. Then you have to check whether it's true or not. You know, Buddha said, don't believe it because I said you have to explore, you have to check. It does desire function on an exaggeration? And then, so anger, aversion function on an exaggeration of the negative quality in somebody. You see, when you get upset at somebody, at that moment you focus on something negative that, that person has done to you, you know. So you, you just isolate that negative thing and you get upset. Yet that person, you know, <coughs> might be a very nice person with his children, with his parents and things like that. And on another day is a very nice person. But at that moment that thing happens and you get upset. So the upset mind focus on the negative quality in someone. You know, or in something, you know, something that hurts you, and then you get upset. So all the negative emotion comes by perceiving the object in the person in a distorted way. So you learn to how it works and to remove this distortion. And to remove it completely, you have to understand how the things really exist. And then in Buddhism, there's many different levels of how things really exist, you know. So you, you, you learn that and explore in meditation how things really exist, you know. And then you discover, you know, your total freedom. You see, liberation is not going to a place. Is a mind, a liberated mind, is a mind that never ever gets angry again is a mind that never ever has desire again, has attachment again, has pride again, has a jealousy again, is a mind that cannot produce any negative emotion anymore. It's a mind that is totally free from those states of mind, that can only have positive emotion. That's a liberated mind, you know? So it comes by seeing things as they are, by, by eliminating the distortion that our consciousness has, by seeing reality, you know. And then your mind becomes, psychologically you become completely free from this negative emotion. And because you have no more negative emotion, negative thought, you don't have any negative result, you don't have any more pain problem that arise to you. But it's not something that you acquire through effort. It's simply your consciousness, by seeing reality, is freed from this negative emotion. So it's not a state that you have to force or, or coerce. You know, you know, I have to stay free from desire. You know, I have to stay free from anger. It's not like that. The mind cannot produce the state of mind anymore. Even if you try, you cannot. You see, it's a man that is totally relaxed, at ease. There's no effort in that. It's a joy, it's a freedom, you know. So that's what, you know, liberation and enlightenment is. It's a psychic that is freed from these disturbed states of mind. You know? And this comes about by, you know, just exploring how these emotions arise and, uh, you know, being able to counteract it. And then by cultivating love and compassion, one can expand one's heart and include and embrace all living beings. You see? On one level, 
we are all one. You know, superficially we separate, but deep down in our heart, we all touch each other. We all connected to each other. You know? And as long as one being suffers somewhere in the universe, the work is not finished. How can you be totally happy as long as one living being somewhere has problem? How can you not care? Right? How, how can you be totally happy as long as you know somewhere, somewhere, someone somewhere has a problem? How can you be completely blissed out knowing that that person has problems? Not possible. Right? So until all living beings are free from suffering, all Buddhas, all beings that have reached and that will continue to work. And we too, it's unending. You see, the work is unending. Until all beings are free, until all beings are happy. Because at the level of the heart, we are all interconnected. And with your heart, with love and compassion, you can really touch the heart of other beings and really care for their happiness. So it comes to the point of a bodhisattva, a higher being, can have hundred body at the same time, helping people in different worlds. At the second level of bodhisattva ground, you can have 10,000 bodies at the same time. At the third level, you can have one million body at the same time doing different things in the universe. And so on is expandable. The quality of our mind, you see, you, you can imagine two mental body. You see, but as your uh, mind becomes cleaner and cleaner, you can create body, light energy body, that can do different things in the universe out of love and compassion. So the qu quality of your mind are incredible, the potential we have is incredible. Mm. No? So that's the, you see, until all beings are free, mm. our work is not finished. And the purpose of our life is to make all beings happy. The purpose of this life and all our future life is to bring happiness to each and every one. That's the purpose of life. And until all living beings are totally happy, that they experience everlasting happiness, that they will never ever suffer again, our job is not finished. No? And that's why we're born again and again, to help all living beings. And when we see the state of this planet, we realize there's a lot of work. <laughs> okay, so now I think it's finished like that. And if you have any questions, you're welcome, you know, otherwise we end. So uh, the only thing to conclude, you see, there's a spiritual journey we are on from life to lifetime. And we're in the middle of it and it's a beautiful adventure that we all take part, we are all part of it, whether we're conscious or not. Life is really, truly beautiful. You know, it's a fantastic adventure we are on, and so beautiful. And we all share it together. Very nice. Okay, thank you.